again, it's very much an introduction to central banking, but specifically what, what do central banks uh, do? Which are the functions for central bank? The roles of a modern central bank in a modern economy? Yeah? So, first of all, could you tell me, just raise your hands and tell me what you think a central bank does, please? Or what is a central bank? Andrew? Control inflation. Control inflation, that's one role. Setting of interest rates. Setting of interest rates, plural. Do you say plural? Interest rates. Um, no. <laughs> I'm going to be very picky with the definition. I yeah? probably meant just um, the singular, but. Just a singular. Yeah, unfortunately. But. <laughs> just a singular but. Promoting financial stability. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Promoting financial stability. Promoting financial stability. That's three. Lender of last resort. Lender of last resort. That's very advanced. You're doing the PPE degree, aren't you? That's really good. If you're John McDonald, it's a source of investment. All right. I take that. I take that. Yeah. So you're not, yeah. Okay. You don't want to take the blame for it. That's why you mentioned uh, McDonald. Yeah. It's fair enough, isn't it? Any other one? No more functions? There are hundreds of people working at the Bank of England, thousands at the ECB. So they must be doing something else. Oh, there's, there's also dealing with things like solvency crises as opposed to near liquidity crises. So liquidity or solvency so, risk? Well, liquidity would ideally be managed by the lender of last resort function. But, okay. But solvency crises are a bit of a different matter. So that might work QE and things like that. So QE, solvency, yeah. anything, any, anything else? I suppose they, you know, at times they cooperate as well, you know, sort of maybe, I don't know. Cooperate with who? Uh, other central banks. With other central banks, yeah, that's correct, yeah. All right, thank you. And Francesca? Isn't it called the Bankers Bank? Yes, so... Is it, it regulates other banks? Yeah, that's the regulator of the banks. Uh, in, most, in most countries, could be a third party, but yeah. All right, any... Um, also, uh, influence monetary policies? Yeah, but that's covered by interest rates, plural or singular, by Andrew. And yeah, isn't it? Yeah. But yes, it's, it's the institution in charge of uh, what we call monetary policy. Yeah, that's correct. And then depending on the instrument used by the central bank, could be changing interest rates or the amount of money circulation. Yeah. yeah? Is that it? Provide forward guidance? That's monetary policy. Yeah. So it's telling, telling the public in advance what you are aiming to do. But yet, that's correct. That's another aspect of uh, monetary policy. Yeah? They also generate and publish their own research? Yes, a lot, actually. Yeah. Especially, that's especially relevant in uh, developing countries. Because the central bank is the, um, the leading <laughs> office with the expertise to advise the government in those topics. Yes, indeed. So yeah, you were, we're filling up the, the, now the, the, the pockets of the, of the central bank with tasks and duties. Okay, let me discuss some of those against the most common answers uh, to that question that I put to you. It's not a tricky question, is it? <laughs> so some, some people say, Andrew, uh, the institution, that's, the institution that sets interest rates or the interest rate, the interest rate setter. Yeah. First of all, we need to define what the interest rate is. You meant surely the policy rate. Am I right? I think so. Yeah. Because there are thousands of interest rates. So even if we put it that way, as the interest rate setter, we need to define much more precisely what we mean by the interest rate. There is no one interest rate in the economy, but many. So if you meant the policy rate, the overnight rate at which the central bank lends out money to the banking sector, that's correct. I'm sorry, I'm very picky with the definitions, but that's, that's how it should, be, it should be put, yeah? What about the second one? The institution in charge of printing money, paper notes in our days, the monopolies in the supply of money or currency. The second part of the, of the answer would be correct. It's the monopolist in the issue of legal money the monetary base in the economy, yeah? Currency in circulation. But what about the first part? It is not. Usually, it is the minting, uh, the minting press, the royal press, is a separate institution from the Bank of, from Bank of England. 
usually it is. So it is not in terms of the production, <laughs> the physical production of the physical money, but indeed it's the monopolist in the issue of legal, uh, legal money, yeah, the monetary base. What about the third one? The institution in charge of monetary policy. So now, sorry, can I see your name? Barney, Barney from Tesca. This, um, and I think, I think it was Andrew as well. This, um, this is what we call monetary policy making or the monetary policy strategy of the Bank of England as a whole. Setting up the expectations of the market, yeah? Uh, could be um, setting out an inflation target. Who set uh, uh, maintaining the purchasing power of the currency? It was you? or somebody else. So looking after the purchasing uh, uh, power of the currency by an inflation targeting strategy, that's another one, yeah? So that's monetary policy, yeah? Usually price stability is the major primary goal of the central bank, but quite many people, indeed economists, and even PhD students, they still think that uh, the central bank is in charge of uh, economic growth, promoting economic growth. They are not. It is not a direct task given to the central banks. It is not. The best the central bank can do is to maintain price stability in order to foster, to enhance uh, business, businesses and economic growth in the country. But it is not a direct task given to central banks anymore. Doesn't the Fed have an employment as a target in there as well, though? It is, but it is not a target. That's precisely what I'm trying to say. Central banks are given a very specific target nowadays in most, well, in all the economies that I know, with one exception, the Federal Reserve, which is to maintain price stability. In the case of the Federal Reserve, legally speaking, they are given three targets to maintain price stability, uh, full employment or maximum employment, and long term um, stability in long term interest rates. That's the so called plural mandate. So That's the exception. Natural, right? Is the maximum, huh. maximum economic growth. That's the way they put it. And so, it's a bit of a digression. How do they, uh, how do they operationalize that? Because That's they, precisely uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, risky. The problem is that that was an amendment to the statutes of the Federal Reserve in the 60s, the Keynesian years. Mm -hmm. That was introduced by the political consensus yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, the way the Federal Reserve interprets that mandate is completely different. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Yes, but they don't have an unemployment rate target or an economic growth target at all, but price stability. Mm -hmm. The way they put it is we do our best to create the monetary conditions in the economy for the economy to prosper by itself, mm -hmm. but we don't have an unemployment rate uh, target or a GDP uh, target. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right? So the URE in the law. Of the, of the central banks, they have only been given one target, uh, price stability. And de facto, that's exactly what they do, even in the case of the Federal Reserve for the US. That is the only exception to the rule. Yeah? What about the other one? In times of crisis, and that's something you, some of you have uh, picked up on, is the institution that bails out banks and keeps financial stability. The second part is correct. Yes, indeed, it is in charge of uh, maintaining financial stability. In the country. But what about bailing out banks? Not at all. It is not the business of the central bank to bail out banks. It is the business of the central bank to lend out money to banks in a liquidity crisis. But that's different. That's different to insolvency crisis. And that's something we are going to deal with in this, uh, in this summer course, not just in my presentation, but in my colleagues Forrest Capi's presentation specifically. We need to make a distinction between lending out money and charging an interest rate for it and bailing out, rescuing a, a, a bank. That, those two things are different. Yeah? Bailing out is giving out, the, giving out the money, basically, to the bank. Yeah? The, other, the other one, lending of large resorts, as you put it, risky, is lending the money against an interest rate. So the money has to be paid back. Yeah? All right? So these are the sort of topics I'm going to discuss uh, with you today. Some of them are going to be addressed in more detail by my colleagues in the next two days. Right? Any questions so far? Okay. Just a bit of history, please. Um, do you know how the Bank of England was established? Yeah? 
1694, and it was a, yeah, it is it was a very special deal between two parties, a government or the crown in need of uh, finance at that time, in order to pay the war expenses against uh, France, and one specific uh, actor in the market, that, the, the, the bank that was going to be called the Bank of England. So it, again, a deal between two parties. The deal consisted of the following. Um, the government was going to grant the monopoly power to issue paper notes to that bank in the metropolitan area of London in the beginning, and then it was extended to the rest of the country. So the only bank able to issue, uh, to produce paper notes in that area. That was just in itself a very profitable business. But not only that, the only bank with exclusive holdings of the government's money accounts. So a very big um, business was going to be given to that bank on top of the monopoly power of uh, issuing of paper notes. And finally, it was going to be the only bank in the country able to be established under limited liability. That's very, very important. All right? The three privileges uh, were given to the Bank of England at the time. In exchange of what? In exchange of the loan of uh, more than uh, one million pounds at the time to, uh, to the government to pay for their war expenses. So indeed, it was a contract between two parties. One party in need of money, the government, and the other party, a profit maximizing central bank, well, commercial bank at the time. All right? That was how the, the, the deal was, uh, was made. This is how the, 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 the Bank of England looked like back in the, in the early 19th century. This is the so-called rotunda of the central bank where customers would come in on a daily basis to do business with the, with, the, with the Bank of England. So it was indeed a bank. Bear in mind that uh, the, the, the central bank is not just like a, an administrative office dependent on the, on the government. No, it is not. <laughs> it is a bank. Uh, providing financial services to the community at the time, to the public as a whole, and also in particular to the banking sector. And this is again how it was depicted at the time. People coming into the bank to exchange paper notes uh, for gold at that time. This is how Vera Smith uh, uh, depicted and explained the establishment of the Bank of England, uh, just the story that I just told you about. I couldn't recommend you more her book, Vera Smith, The Rational of Central Banking and the Free Banking Alternative. You can, finally, sorry, you can find it online as well, or order a copy. Um, she was a pupil of Frederick Hayek's, and she, this is actually her uh, PhD dissertation, 1936. The reason why I mention Hayek is because from 1936 to 1976, more than 40 years, no one, literally no one that I know of, was interested in this topic, in the alternatives to central banking, private solutions to, to, to the, the problems created by the monopoly of uh, issue. And it was uh, uh, Freddie Hayek in 1976 writing and publishing a, a, a pamphlet uh, uh, for the IEA the denationalization of money. So, please, this book uh, is really highly recommendable. Uh, is, it has the history of uh, how central banks were created, not just in the UK, uh, the Bank of England, the Scottish system, France, Germany, and then the arguments uh, pro and against uh, free banking. All right. What about the relationship between um, because nobody mentioned, when I asked you about the, the, the relationship between the, I mean, the functions of the central bank, nobody told me anything about the relation between the central bank and the government. It is a tricky, it is a tricky relationship, to say the least. Here you have how that relationship was depicted at the time, at the time of the, of the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Uh, these, this is a very famous cartoon uh, uh, made at the time by uh, James Gilray. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Gilray. Um, he depicted here the constant appeals of the Bank of England, oh sorry, of the government, 
William Pitt, this is the government, to the Bank of England for money, more and more money to pay for the, for the wars against France. And the old lady is trying to resist to the demands coming from the government to, to give him uh, more money. This is called the, the old lady of Threadneedle Street in danger. And since then, since that very year, that's the nickname of the Bank of England, the old lady of Threadneedle Street. So just so you know, this is the reason why uh, we have that nickname uh, in our days. And it was a government, again, in crisis, in need of finance, assaulting the vaults of the Bank of England. Now this relationship is much more subtle, much more civilized, but still, it's quite substantial. This is the balance sheet of the Bank of England. So here you have several components of the balance sheet of the Bank of England before and after the crisis. So before 2009, the summer of 2009 and afterwards. Uh, well, first of all, you can tell the, the, the massive change in the size of the balance sheet of the Bank of England. Uh, from this level up to this level. This is a percentage of the GDP, the ratio of the GDP here. Yeah? So you can tell that this rate area increased massively during the crisis. These are government securities, government bonds, treasury bonds. So what this, diagram, sorry, this chart is telling you is that during the crisis, for many reasons, the Bank of England was purchasing the debt issued by the government. So it was facilitating funding to, to the government at the time. How much? Well, up to 25 or even 30 percent of, uh, of the GDP. A lot of money. So indeed, we don't have these assaults. <laughs> yeah, but now the system is much more institutional, uh, sorry, regulated. So it, is, uh, it has become like a um, customary for governments to benefit from the monetization of the deficits. Have you heard about this before? So basically it's uh, a government running deficits finds it more and more difficult to find a finance in capital markets. Interest rates uh, go higher and higher, risk premium as we say. So they find it much easier to, to, to sell the debt to, to, to a, a privileged bank, the, the central bank. And that's why we have this accumulation of uh, bonds, government securities, in the vaults of the, of the central bank. So indeed, the central bank, you can tell, it is the, it is the bank of the government. Yeah? In normal times, this is very much uh, limited and restricted. But when difficult times arise, in terms of a major financial crisis, no one stops the, 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 the central bank from uh, helping other government as we can, we can tell. All right. So this is just what I said, is the bank of the government, that's the first function I wanted to, to, to tell you. Since the very establishment of the Bank of England, yeah, it is the bank of the government. And secondly, the links with the government are really strong and they have always have been, yeah? About, um, the bank of banks functions of the central bank, somebody mentioned, I think it was yourself, was it you? Bank of banks? Or was it you, Francesca? Well, you'll realize at the end of uh, today how bad I am at, uh, with names. All right, that's why we have these uh, badges. Yeah. Um, how money is created in our economies is key for you to understand this relation between the central bank and the banking sector. What we have at the moment is what we call a fractional reserve banking system. Have you heard of it? No? Anyone who has, could you please tell me a brief definition? Yeah. Well, it's complicated, but essentially the central bank lends out to other banks who can then multiply that lending and to keep leverage it. it to keep it more simple. You go to your local branch and you deposit 100 pounds. Mm. How much money, how much out of that uh, deposit has the central bank, has the commercial bank have to, to, to keep? Only about 10%, isn't it? Could be from, from 1% to 10%, yeah. Could be more, but only, the, the key point is only a fraction of your money is kept there at the, at the commercial bank. The rest can be lent out, yeah? That's fractional reserve banking. 
So what the commercial bank is effectively doing is lending out that money, that those 90 pounds or X pounds, to another customer. The other customer will be able to make payments with those, uh, with those deposits. And effectively they are creating money and making a profit out, out of it. Yeah? That's the fractional reserve banking system. So, this system was very well run, or even governed, at the time of the gold standard. At the time of the gold standard, the Bank of England had to maintain the convertibility. It was a legal requirement, the convertibility of the paper notes into gold. Yeah? On demand, at any time. That imposed a very important, a really uh, severe restriction of the Bank of, on the Bank of England to over-issue paper notes. There had to be, as we put it here, a correspondence between the amount of money created by the central bank and the value of the reserves stored within the bank. If the bank over-issued too much money issued from here, customers would come to the bank and exchange paper notes for gold. That would produce a drain, an internal drain of gold, and that would put at risk the convertibility of the, of, of the paper notes into gold. So there was a, technically, it was a system that preserved the convertibility of a, a paper money into gold and kept the, the, the issue of the, of, the, of the money in check. Yeah? That's, that's, how, that's how the system operated back in the days of the, of the gold standard. In our days, please don't go to the Bank of England and ask for your silver or your gold back. You wouldn't get it. They would send you the police and escort you uh, to the door. Yeah? There is no such a requirement to back paper notes uh, with uh, gold or any precious metal. So, theoretically, there is no limit for the Bank of England or any other central bank to expand the amount of money as they wish. Potentially, theoretically, it's unlimited. That's for you to remember. There is no limit uh, 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 on the ability of the central bank to create new money. That's what we call a purely fiat monetary, monetary system. One that is not backed by anything else, any assets. An example of this... Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Argentina before, yeah? Spain at the time of the empire, many times, <laughs> yeah? There are many examples, sadly. And in all these examples, it all ended up in hyperinflation. An excessive amount of money ended up in an in increase in, the, in, in, in prices, a massive increase in prices. <coughs> so basically we need, yeah, sorry. That's a good question. Uh, let me just uh, okay. briefly tell. No, I'm going I'm to tell you right now. Yeah. This is um, 250 years of uh, inflation in the UK, 1750 to well nowadays. Yeah. So after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Bank of England resumed the convertibility. I mean, resumed the gold standard the obligation to, go, to, to redeem uh, paper notes for, for gold. And we had a period of uh, more than 100 years of monetary and pr price stability. This means that prices back in uh, 1810s were roughly similar to prices 100 years later. Yeah? Let me repeat it. This is not inflation, this is uh, prices, CPI prices. So, the amount of money you would have spent in your groceries in 1810 would be roughly the same as that in 1910. That's, that's remarkable, to say the least. Yeah? What happened afterwards, obviously, after the two world wars, is the collapse of the gold standard, risky. Yeah? In the, depending on the country, but in the interwar, uh, interwar uh, uh, period. There was no obligation of the central bank to maintain that convertibility. So as I said before, no restrictions to overissue the amount of money in circulation. Is that a Bretton Woods? Though? That's the Bretton Woods system in the 40s after the war. Right. So again, no, 
no technical, no real constraint on the central bank and the governments to to monetize increasing deficits and debts. So you have the combination of two things, Risky. Your, your intuition was correct. The abandonment of the gold standard, and then in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, governments uh, recurring to, to resort into the central bank more and more to pay for the deficits. That's the, the, the evil combination of the two. Yeah? Again, at the time of the gold standard, here you have uh, the directors of the bank in this pot asking the, the, the money holders not to bring more money into the bank. Please don't, don't bring more paper notes. We have no, no metallic coins to, to, to give you any, any gold back. Yeah? So at that time there was a correspondence between one thing and the other. Now there isn't. That's the reason why we need a monetary policy rule to try to prevent the central bank from exploiting that power. That's why we have inflation targeting forward guidance, as you put it, is how to limit, how to, um, how to restrict the ability of the central bank to over-issue. That's all it's about. Yeah? And this diagram is just, uh, I mean, it couldn't be, couldn't be a better, better representation of what uh, the abandonment of the gold standard uh, meant. We only resumed some monetary stability in the late 80s and early 90s. So you can tell that still prices are growing here, but not as exponentially as before. Yeah? Only a little bit less. Yeah? All right. Let me tell you more, more about uh, the, the function of, of, of the central bank as the bank of banks. Indeed, the, the central bank is a banking institution providing financial services, nowadays not just to the general public, but to a very specific market, commercial banks. What does the central bank do for, for, for commercial banks? Well, it does a lot. <coughs> Firstly, it provides what we call the monetary standard of the economy. That's the currency. Hopefully a stable currency they, they can do business with. And very importantly, every, in, in the UK it's 10 times, uh, 10 times per year, every so often one, again, 10 times per year, or in other countries, one per month, there is a, an electronic, a virtual meeting between the central bank and all those banks, commercial banks, operating in that country. In that meeting, what the central bank does is to auction money. It's what we call the auctions of liquidity. Have you heard about those? No? So basically, imagine that uh, it used to be a physical meeting, but now again, it's not, it's electronic. So imagine that I'm the central banker, and I'm in this uh, meeting with 20, all the 20 commercial banks operating in Buckingham, well, or in the UK. Um, you would be putting your bids for X amount of money. Uh, I would be collecting all your bids. You would be willing to pay X interest rate for that money. And then at the end of the session, at the end of the day, I would be willing to give you X amount of money at X interest rate. So it's literally, it's an auction of money. Who is the monopolist in this auction? The central bank. Who pays for that money? The banking sector. So it is indeed a very profitable activity for the central bank. Why? Because the commercial banks will have to pay an interest rate. That's the interest, interest rate that we call the policy rate, Andrew. That's the policy rate, yeah? yeah. <laughs> that is set up uh, 10 times per year by the Bank of England or every month in other central banks, yeah? And that's the rate commercial banks have to pay to access uh, this liquidity, All right? Who benefits from the profits that the central bank makes? Because it's the private ownership of central banks, or in the UK anyway, has stopped since... 1947. Yeah, so, so who benefits? Yeah, so the government. But yeah. Because it, but it's a separate entity in so much as... It is an independent organisation, independent entity from the government, but it's still public sector. It was nationalised in 1947. So, so all the revenues, the way they are uh, distributed, uh, the, the central bank will keep all the money needed to operate their, their businesses, and they will revert the, the, the excess uh, to, the, to, the, to the Chancellor of the Cheque. Because haven't the BOJ... Uh, bank of Japan? Yeah. Yes. 
started to kind of write off their own debt because they've, they've done massive quantitative easing over. By the Bank of Japan, sorry, by the Bank of Japan is different. The Bank of Japan is one of the few central banks uh, uh, which uh, does have uh, private shareholders. Okay. That's a different. There are three or four central banks, as far as I'm aware, South African Reserve Bank, the Swiss uh, National Central Bank, uh, Greece Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan. So the arrangements there are different. Well, I've heard also though, that the Bank of Japan is technically also, I don't know if this makes sense in the context of it being privately held, but it's also an institution of the government. So it's not just that they're being privately held, but it's also an institution of the government. And so it would be a bit like government holding government debt, which means that it's not holding any debt. Because it's the problem is, it's very, difficult, it's very difficult to draw the line. It has uh, shareholders, but it is very much dependent on the government. To be honest with you, I don't know the specifics on how the money is distributed amongst the shareholders and the government. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't know about Japan. In the case of the UK, I know that any excess of the, the, the money that the Bank of England needs to operate the business goes back into the, into the budget, the revenues of the, the, of the, the treasury. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? So indeed, uh, ultimately, the, the one that benefits from these operations is the government. Yeah. So, have you heard about open market operations? Yes. That's how these auctions of liquidity are conducted. Okay. So it's an exchange, a repo operation between a commercial, a commercial bank or commercial banks and the central bank. An exchange of uh, lending for a collateral. Then this lending will be for, I don't know, a week period or two weeks or a month after that period the operation will be reversed. The central bank will return that asset to the, to the commercial bank, and that, that would be it. Hmm? All right? Then we have what we call quantitative easing in times of crisis, which is, is related, but it's separate. Now what the central bank will do is to purchase assets from the banking sector and from other companies, non-financial companies. But this is a straightforward uh, and outright purchase. This is not a repo operation. This is a permanent addition of an asset into the balance sheet of the, of the central bank. All right? And why would the central bank do this? Please tell me. Why would you buy an asset held by either a bank or a non-financial company? How was being insolvent? It was even towards insolvency, so they would buy it out to them. At the moment, forget about uh, solvency issues, just for monetary policy purposes. I, my understanding though is, is that, isn't it the case that they buy um, long dated assets from non banks? Is that what you're saying? That's one option, two options. Oh, okay. One is from banks, government securities, uh -huh. uh, short term maturity or long term maturity, yeah, yeah. and long term maturity usually from non uh, financial corporations. Why would you do that in the first place? Well, I guess the issue is that those are actually, as far as I can tell, qualitatively different operations. I mean, but try to keep it simple. Try to keep it simple. Okay. Why would you do it? Yeah. Well, okay. ideally, what you think would happen is that you'd increase the quantity of money in the economy. That's it. Yeah. Then there is, a, there is an important distinction between these two. Yeah. Risky. I'm not going to go into it because I know Tim will in the next yeah. session. True. That's the only reason why. Yeah. But. First and foremost, it is to increase the amount of money in the economy. Money is falling in times of crisis, even collapsing in some economies. You want to prevent that from happening. And you buy assets from banks and non-banks. So effectively, you are paying money into their accounts, increasing the amount of money. Yeah? Why? So... During the financial crisis, quantitative easing seems to have been the go-to method to try and do what you just said. Why isn't sort of helicopter money where it goes directly to the actual consumer, the man in the street, a better method to actually try to get money into a, an economy rather than giving it to an institution that doesn't necessarily have to lend it out? Well, that's, that's precisely the reason why I made the distinction between QE through the banking sector to be honest, you are, couldn't be more right. The banking sector didn't use that money, that excess uh, uh, in money to, to lend it out yeah. to the rest of the economy. And that's why in some countries, 
like the Federal Reserve, for example, in the US, they did buy directly from the real economy, from non-banks. So effectively putting money into the hands of those companies, able to spread it out across the economy. Helicopter money is, is a step forward. Yeah. Is, is, I'm sure you have seen these uh, uh, caricatures of uh, Ber Bernanke at the time, throwing money from an actual helicopter <laughs> to the economy. That's, that's a bit extreme, in my opinion. Uh, because uh, what is the end to that? I mean, that's, again, we can end up in uh, Venezuela very quickly. It's not that I don't like Venezuela, I love the country, but I don't like Why inflation. Why is that different if the amount of money is the same? And if, I mean, one of the main arguments I heard was that, oh, well, people will just pay down their debts. But if the money, if they do do that, which they wouldn't necessarily, but if they do, then it will end up in a lot of the same institutions that it would have any. If you do it through the, not through uh, hel helicopter money, but through the non-financial corporation, you're expecting those corporations, those corporations to expand their businesses. Whereas in case of, again, this is the context of a financial crisis, yeah? Uh, people highly leveraged, they would pay that money, uh, they would, sorry, they would use that money to pay for the debts. Mm -hmm. That's one of the arguments against it. Whereas a, a real economy corporation, they will be much more willing to spend the money. That's one of the arguments. The other argument is the one that I just said, is where to stop. Once you start this helicopter money policy, it's very easy to, it's very easy to, to run an inflationary policy. Where do you stop? That's the point. And again, may I stress, this is a very extraordinary policy for, a time, uh, for, for times of crisis, when the normal banking channel uh, doesn't work, doesn't operate. Do you think it will stay like that? Then? At the moment, more than 10 years after the crisis, it is, it's, still the, uh, it's still on the table. Right. So for a long time, until, only one second, until the, the, the banking sector is able to lend our money to the economy, it will remain, in my view, for the next uh, maybe th three, even four or five years, an operating tool in the hands of, the, of central banks, yes. Actually, it's one of the policies that is being proposed for the central bank to resume in the next few months. To what degree has the need to use quantitative easing and the use of quantitative easing itself as a tool, uh, to what degree has it kind of undermined the mainstream monetary policy theories that we've operated under quite a since the late 70s, 80s? And to what degree is that open kind of the floodgates for alternative theories to, to emerge? Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have a full answer to that. I will give you my intuition. Um, remember, <coughs> and I couldn't stress this more, this is an emergency tool for emergency times. I'm not advocating for this on a permanent basis. If the, if, yeah, but if the normal circuit, the open market operations circuit, the lending through the banking sector works well, use it. When that channel is, has collapsed, basically, and you have a, a situation in which, like for example, Greece, deposits are being destroyed, which means you can't, you can't have access to your own money in the banks. It wasn't that radical as uh, to what happened in America, in the US in the 30s, where on average up to 33, 35% of people's deposits evaporated. 30 to 35% of your money on average just went. But here we were able to contain that um, uh, outcome by engaging in quantitative easing with the rest of the economy. <coughs> but that's the context, yeah? So I'm not advocating for this on, on a normal, ordinary basis, yeah? But in times of extraordinary crisis, do we want, do we want to have uh, the rates of unemployment the US had at the time? Uh, deposits evaporating? No, let's do this. <laughs> yeah? So that would be my first caveat. Yeah? Secondly, um, I still think we need to use it now in order to prevent the amount of money from uh, falling even further. At the moment, the amount of money in the, in the UK is growing but very modestly at a 1.52%, yeah? That's nothing. In historical terms, this means a risk of deflation in the future. So if the ordinary banking channel is not working, 
I'm sorry, you have to do something. <laughs> QE may be a valid way to do it. Yeah? If I could add something yeah. as well. I mean, uh, it's a question I've also considered. Um, you know, to what extent does QE undermine also the presuppositions of the policy, and more particularly, like the importance of narrow money as opposed to broad money, let's say. And I think that it's actually one of the questions that Milton Friedman wrestled with, because for my, the majority of his career, I think I preferred M2, which the American monetarists tend to prefer, as opposed to broader measures by the British monetarists. Yeah. And the reason he did that is because it seemed to be the case that M2 and M3 brought in narrow money, tended to co very roughly congruently for the, the, the period in which he analyzed the data. And so it didn't really matter which one you chose, because the lending mechanism was functional. Mm -hmm. But during times of crisis, uh, M3 would go like this, and M2 would go like this. Excess reserves would increase, but no increase in the broad economy, and yeah. no increase in national income. So that seemed to imply that it wasn't effective anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that the theory is undermined as far as, as it's ineffective in crisis times, but in normal times, perhaps it's intact. In normal times, everything is much more, as I said, ordinary, normal. Everything works fine. So why doing this? Exactly. I agree with you. Right. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. It is in extraordinary times when you have to innovate. Yeah? Uh, but let me give you an example, maybe, maybe I can put it clearer to you. Let's take the example of the US Federal Reserve. They were sending contradictory messages to the banking sector. So on the one hand, they were willing to lend out more and more money, even to engage in QE. Give me your assets, I'm willing to pay you money for, for it. Yeah? Give me whatever you have in your portfolio, I'll take it. Yeah? Nobody else is willing to buy it, I do. That's an expansionary monetary policy, creating more money. To, to them. But at the same time, what the Federal Reserve did is to increase the, the interest paid on the reserves of the banking sector at the Federal Reserve. So what are you going to do with that money in times of crisis where there is no return anywhere else? You put it very safely in your own central bank. All right? That's precisely what has happened and still happens in the US. So it is, again, it is like a like a contradictory policy. On the one hand, you, are expand, you want, you aim at expanding the amount of money in the economy. On the other hand, you are encouraging your own banks to deposit their excess of money in your own central bank. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, so other, let me move on. <laughs> other other um, uh, roles or functions or services provided by the central bank to the banking community as I said, extraordinary lending, this is something that Forest, is, Forest Cap is going to address and I will do very briefly later. Clearing facilities. Do you know that all the checks or all the, the, the electronic orders that you make to make a payment from one account in one bank to somebody else, uh, sorry, to somebody else's account in another bank, all of those operations take place at the end of the day through the central bank clearing facility. In that sense, it's a bank, of, a bank of banks providing financial services for the banking sector to settle the balances. Yeah? Every commercial bank in the country holds a deposit account, a current account in the Bank of England. Why? Because they will need to pay at the end of the day or to be credited an X amount of money against the operations made by the clients with the rest of the banking sector. That's facilitated by the Bank of England in this country. Yeah? That's a very important service. The Bank of England is the, the central of the reserves, the liquidity of the banking sector. So every bank will be depositing uh, X amount of money, of the depositors' money, in the Bank of England. In case needed, they will be able to go back and ask for that money. But not just that money, but other banks' money. I'll explain you why in a minute. And then, somebody said before, supervision and regulation on the banking sector. Yes, the central bank lends out money on a regular and on an extraordinary basis to the banking sector. But what happens when a bank lends out money? They would like to inspect the, 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 the books uh, of their debtor. They want to see if you will be able to pay back. That's exactly the same rationale applying to the loans made by the central bank to the banking system. That's why the central bank usually uh, regulates and uh, supervises the operations of the commercial banks in the country. Yeah? 
So, just to summarize, on top of the other two functions that I just mentioned before, the bank of the government, indeed, it also sets the amount of money in circulation or the policy rate to maintain the purchasing power of the currency, usually in our days via adopting an inflation targeting monetary strategy. That's the most common strategy, by which I'm sure you're aware of, the central bank will be announcing a quantitative de definition of uh, inflation. I would like to achieve uh, a 2% inflation or lower by the end of 2020, and this is what I'm going to do in order to achieve that target. That's sort of a, a brief explanation of inflation targeting. And also provides very important financial services to, to the banking sector, to the banking community. Yeah, that's another set of rules. What about in times of crisis? And here you have the old lady of Threadneal Street, a little bit more aged, as you can tell. That was 1890s, at the time of the Bearings crisis. Bearings was a very, a very a significant player in the banking sector in London at the end of the 19th century and invested very heavily in South America. Those investments didn't go well and the bank uh, had a severe crisis. So what the Bank of England, again depicted here as the old lady of Threadneal Street, managed to do is to first to lend out money to that bank in crisis to keep it in business and then to arrange a consortium, a, a coalition of banks, private banks, to rescue uh, their competitor, to maintain that bank uh, uh, afloat, basically, to maintain confidence in the banking sector, the stability, financial stability in the economy. So that has been a key role played by central bank, well, since the 19th century, if not uh, the late 18th century in the case of Britain. So for more than a hundred years, the lender of large resource function of the central bank has been operating and very successfully. It's not something new at all. Sorry, you had a question. Was bearings, the bank that was it Nick Gleason took the rogue trader, he basically destroyed with... It was the investments in um, Argentina, railways in Argentina. I'm not sure about that name, to be honest with you. It, this was later. In, in oh, I, I, you mean later? No, I'm yeah, talking about the 19th century. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I'm talking about so the 19th century. Bearings were to be honest with you, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you mean the very recent ones? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You mean this young, this young trader? Yeah, yeah. I think he was he was in the, his late uh, 20s, if I remember well. Yeah. Yet with no supervision whatsoever, he was absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought you meant I thought you meant just a few years later. Yeah. Yeah, but I wouldn't identify a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, bless them. It's one more than a hundred years between one yeah, and the other. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought you meant something else. Such a rich history, and yet this one person has just managed to. That that reveals a lot of um, weaknesses in the the, the the infrastructure, the structure, the the, the oversee of the, these operations. Really, that that was crazy. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So here, what I really found very interesting of this uh, caricature is that uh, if you read it from, from your chairs, it reads something like, um, where are we? Yeah, you've got yourselves into a nice mess with your pre precious speculation. That's, that's the Bank of England telling off the banks. These are the banks holding the cards, can you tell? Uh, you've got yourselves into a nice mess with your precious speculation. <coughs> well, I will help you out of it for these ones. Careful for these ones, because that was... Uh, more than 100 years ago, and that has happened uh, several other times afterwards. This is what we call the moral hazard uh, problem. But never mind, how, in case you needed to do it, in case, and again, remember your name, please. Lawrence. Lawrence. We're talking about a financial crisis here, or at least a banking crisis affecting one, one bank, yeah? This is not ordinary, yeah? <laughs> I'm not advocating for this uh, on a normal basis. In case there is a, a liquidity crisis affecting one bank, how should the central bank intervene in order to prevent a contagion of uh, other banks and eventually financial instability? Could anyone tell me what liquidity, liquidity crisis uh, uh, means, please? Is it um, where the banks have their balance sheets, don't they? So they have obviously assets and yeah yeah that's a good approach but, but then so they you know you, 
it come itself basically? No, nope. no. Nope. I said okay. I said an illiquidity or liquidity crisis. Okay. That's precisely what I want you to do to make a distinction between insolvency and illiquidity. Keep it, keep it easier, keep it simple. All right. much, much more simple than that. You are a bank, just uh, you have your book, your books, assets, liabilities. Tell me when you are illiquid. When they don't cover one another, when your assets don't cover your liabilities. That's insolvency. When the total value of your assets uh, does not cover your liabilities, you are bankrupt, you are insolvent. But there is a, a more minor problem that we call cash flow, yeah? Which means? Shortage of cash. Short-term cash, food income, current income. So you don't have enough cash to, to, to pay your, your, your liabilities. It doesn't mean that, that should you be able to sell off all your assets, you wouldn't be able to pay your, your, your uh, liabilities. It's that in the very short term, you don't have enough money, cash, to pay your depositors money, yeah? So still, your assets value is higher than your liabilities, but you don't have a currency, cash, to pay for it. That's a liquidity crisis. And that's precisely the type of crisis for what the lender of large resource, lender of large resource function is for. Not for insolvency, illiquidity, yeah? Can you just enable the problem though, like you say, moral hazard, once you remove that, if you behave badly, you will be punished. If, they, if large banks, commercial banks, know that they can essentially get help, then... They're yes, they're but bear with me for a second, Joshua. Can I delay my answer for a second? Yes, because they will be punished. According to Walter Badgett, and this is another book that I highly recommend, Lombard Street, it was written in 1873, a description of the money market, this one. Walter Badger was a, a journalist. I think he was a member of parliament. Uh, well, he was many things, really. He was the editor of the, of the Economist at the time, if I remember well. And he wrote this, uh, well, this classic, really, uh, on how the monetary system worked at the time, uh, at the late uh, 19th century in Britain. And many principles still apply to the current system. It's really fascinating. He set up the rules by which the central bank should run these uh, lending, extraordinary lending facilities, in order to avoid a panic, but prevent the commercial banks from doing so repeatedly over and over again. So what he said is, yes, in case of a liquidity crisis affecting one bank, yeah, bank A, whichever it is, let's try to contain the panic because if people from other customers of other banks see that there is a problem with bank A, they may want to go to their own bank and withdraw the money. And that would trigger a truly banking crisis and potentially even a solvency crisis. Let's try to stop it. So the way to do it is to lend readily and as much as needed, no limit, unlimited amount of money to that bank in trouble. Yeah? But do it always against collateral. What does it mean? The ban has to show that it will be able to pay back. People, he didn't put it that way, but some people have interpreted it as, a, as a, a penalty rate, a higher than standard than normal interest rates. So you, you dissuade the commercial bank from doing, doing so, from appealing to this facility over and over again. Those are the three classical criteria to operate the lender of large resource function. If it is operated properly, at the end of a few days, or few weeks, when the panic is contained, the commercial bank will be able to pay back uh, that loan. It is a loan, it is not a gift, yeah? And pay interest on that loan to the bank, to the central bank. That, these criteria were um, operated by the Bank of England several times, successfully in the 19th century. And indeed, it was so successful for the uh, Bank of England that they really run even extraordinary profits. Higher than normal interest rates, remember. So, very important, it is not a gift, it is a loan. And the commercial bank will be uh, accessing this facility only if it is solvent, so it has to prove that it has collateral, 
and it will pay a higher than normal interest rate. Actually, it was so successful, this reminds me of your question about profits, the profits of the Bank of England. It was so successful that the government at the time uh, came to an agreement with the Bank of England, remember it was a private institution, to split up the, the revenues from these uh, operations, 50 and 50. Yeah? It was really successful. All right? So if operated uh, properly, it will contain the contagion and the, the, the financial panic, and it will be profitable for the banking system as a whole and the central bank particularly. Yeah? So indeed, in terms of crisis, especially in a fractional reserve banking system, remember, only an actual fraction of your money is kept by the, by the commercial bank. We need to have a lender of large resort, be it a private central bank, I don't mind if this is a private central bank, another uh, uh, bank, a competitor, providing extraordinary lending, or the central banks as we know them now. But you must have that agent maintaining stability in the financial system. So this is it. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, you can find me here on that email if you want to drop me a line later in the day or when you return home uh, uh, later after the summer session. And I will be very happy to take your questions now.